When I was with you last, I pointed out how the church in Korea has an incredible privilege, responsibility, and challenge. Because you're in the advanced modern world, and yet you're still growing and spiritually powerful. Whereas if you look at the Western world, the more advanced the West is, the less powerful the church has become. And you can see that modernity has undermined the Western world. Now, the basic reason is to do with the supernatural. In the West, what is unseen is also considered unreal. And of course, that rules out prayer and spiritual warfare. But I want to talk about another topic today, and that is passing the baton from generation to generation. You remember the Beijing Olympics in 2008? They were the first Olympics ever with no Americans on the podium for the relay races. Now, there were some very fast people that year, like Usain Bolt, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was they dropped the baton. Again and again, the American runners, although they were fast, they dropped the baton. And in much of the West, that is happening in the church. Generations are not passing on the faith to the next generation. Now, think of that biblically. As the rabbis point out, what did Moses talk about the night of the Passover? 430 years of slavery, and tonight they're going free. But Moses never talks about freedom. Abraham had been promised a land, and tonight they're setting off for the promised land of milk and honey. Moses never talked about the promised land. Three times Moses talked about children. In other words, if any project, and the church is one, if any project lasts longer than a single generation, you need families, you need schools, and you need history to pass it on well. And of course, that's what the Jews have done incredibly well, despite terrible scattering and terrible persecution all across the world. So they've lost their land, they lost their capital, they lost their temple, and they've survived. And the reason is they passed on the faith well, as Christians should do too. Think of some of the reasons for that. Take a very simple example you can see in the Bible. In Judges, Chapter 8, you have Gideon coming to take over a city, and he captures a young teenager and asks him to tell the names of the leaders in the city of Succoth. And the young teenager can write down 77. Now, people don't notice that tiny verse, but that's quite extraordinary. In much of the world, you only had cuneiform or hieroglyphs or pictograms. So, for example, they were so complicated in China or Egypt or Babylon that only the elite in the palace or the temple had access to the alphabet. But the first proto-Semitic alphabet was invented around the time of the Exodus, and it had less than 30 letters. And you can see that meant that there was literacy for everyone, even a teenager. And that idea runs through the whole of the Bible and right down after the Bible. Take the Jewish festivals. All the pagan countries, all the pagan world had festivals. But in paganism, you celebrated nature, spring, harvest, and all these sorts of things, because people depended on nature not in the Jewish world. The festivals were all to do with history, the Passover celebrating the Passover in Egypt, the feast celebrating the giving of the Ten Commandments, 
the Feast of the Booths, celebrating the passage through the wilderness. In other words, they celebrated history and what God had done, which was the basis of their faith. And the challenge, as the Jews put it, you had to so celebrate year after year that it was as if you had been there yourself. So that young people who had not been there or later generations who had not been there celebrated the festivals and were as if they'd been there with Moses at the Passover and so on. Do you have a great sense of history like that? in Korea? In much of the West, we are so driven by technology. And of course, if a new invention comes in, a new iPhone, a new Samsung, everything that's yesterday's model is outdated. And what's old is outdated and absolutely irrelevant, and you throw it out. Or we have a great focus on the present. The church has to be relevant, they say. The latest must be the greatest. The newer must be truer. And so you have churches chasing their tails to be relevant, but losing touch with the word. And the only way to be relevant eternally is to be in touch with eternity. And yet much of the American church is chasing its relevance and quickly becoming irrelevant. Or you have simple crises in the West, like the collapse of the dining table. When I was a young man in China and then in Europe, the family dining table, everyone came together for supper. And that's where we shared as a family. And that's where I learned the stories of my family over the years. In America, though, with fast life, the family dining table has become like a Grand Prix pit stop to refuel. Someone's going to a sports game, someone to a, a violin lesson, and people just come in quickly, grab their food and race off. And there's no cohesion and there's no history in the dining table. So there are many reasons where you have the church in the West with a low view of history, a breakup of the family, and no real sense of schooling, even in church schools. And so the younger generation, Generation Z, as they call it in America, does not have a strong sense of faith handed down. Now you see that in the New Testament, Paul talking about Timothy and the roots of his faith and so on. And I would say that's been the key to my family. As many of you know, I come from a famous Irish family and my branch of the family has kept the faith for generations. And many of us think it goes back to the prayer of a remarkable woman, my great, great grandmother. There was a duel in Ireland when a city councillor insulted a political leader and the only recourse was a duel. The widow of the councillor, 22, with a little child, was depressed in the scandal and bankruptcy and considered suicide. Fortunately for our family, she came back to faith and she met and married her second husband, my great, great grandfather. But what's wonderful is the family records show that every day my great, great grandmother prayed for 10 generations of us. And in my side of the family, there's no break in generation after generation of people who've been followers of Jesus. So I would say to you, dear Korean sisters and brothers, you have this immense privilege before the Lord for the whole world, keeping alive the supernatural, keeping alive prayer, and what I'm challenging today, keeping alive that gift of passing on the faith from generation to generation. The Lord keeps his word. And he is faithful, as the Bibles tell us, 
to a thousand generations. Every generation is a pulse beat in the story of humanity. I would challenge you as families, as individuals, and as Sarang Church to be people who hand on the faith so the torch of faith in the Lord shines as brightly in the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and on generations until the end of time. What a privilege to be with you as you turn to prayer. The Lord bless you and keep the flame of faith alive and burning brightly across the modern world. Thank you and God bless you.